I'm Desiree. And I'm Jordan. And this is the newest member of our crew, Captain Oso, the little dude. We just bought our dream blue water sailboat called Atticus 2, and we're working hard to transform her from a weekend cruiser into a long distance offshore voyager. Recently, we finally set sail on our first trip aboard Atticus 2. After motoring through dense fog, we closed in on our first port of call, the Mystic River. Welcome to Sailing Project Atticus. So there's a bifurcation marker up there, and then there's the green, Those, that's the channel and then you're just gonna take a left around this green here, then it's straight forward. Our brave and fearless leader. Hey, buddy. He's so funny. He's like just kind of clingy today, so he either has to be touching Jordan or touching me. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. I got a call from Mystic Seaport Marina saying that there's some weather on its way and that we should really try to make this bridge opening. And the highway bridge opens every hour, 40 minutes after the hour. And I don't know if we're gonna make it. So yeah, this is the railroad bridge. So this is the one that is open most of the time unless there is a train coming through. The next one is the highway bridge. All right, can you go radio them? Yeah. Mystic Highway Bridge, Mystic Highway Bridge. This is sailing vessel Atticus. Atticus Highway. Yeah, hi, uh, we were uh, radioing earlier. We kind of booked it over here to try to get through. Are you guys still open by any chance? Negative. Negative, okay, copy that, thanks. Well, we didn't even get close to making the bridge. So we only gotta wait another, oh, only another 25 minutes. You are very, very lovey today. <laughs> yeah. Mystic Seaport, Mystic Seaport. Good afternoon, Atticus. Let's see you through the bridge. Hey, yeah, we made it. Just want to let you know we, we're coming your way. Okay, we made it. And first thing I'm going to do, <laughs> I don't even want to hear it, buddy. Yeah. You got something to say, buddy? Not a thing, Yeah, buddy. didn't think so. <laughs> All right, well, cheers and welcome to Mystic Seaport. off to check out the seaport. And we're matching. And we're matching, Kizzy. which is Desiree's like basically <laughs> primary objective every day. <laughs> hey buddy, you want a hat? You want a Pacific Seacraft hat? Yeah. <laughs> so Oso's pretty pumped to see the seaport, which in my opinion is probably the world's premier boating outdoor museum. It's, it's like, the real deal. It's like Disneyland for boats. Gosh, this is so neat. I feel like I'm stepping back in time. Hey, how are you? Hey, welcome to the Nautical Shack. Hey, all right. In this building, we have the tools that people on the Morgan would have used to navigate around the world. So you, you're pointing the sextant at the horizon. If that was the North Star up there, you'd be moving it like this, and, and that would project the North Star down to the horizon, and then you just read the angle. This does the same thing, okay? And that, So if you're looking like this, that's your horizon, and then you point to the North Star, that's your angle. And that angle is your latitude.
so cool? There's a sermon playing that was actually delivered here in 1890. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. That is the place where men are slain and their wives made mourners. And you can see some of the things that we've created here. Um, not only the harpoons wow. um, for other museums, but also things like jet packs. So these are not big body piercings. <laughs> they are not shower curtain rings. <laughs> uh, these are the rings that the triangular sails go up and down. Hmm. This is a step by step on how to just make a simple harpoon head. Oh wow! This is how many heats it would take. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to create the final shape that you'd grind in. Wow! Just to make. One of these. Something like that, yeah. wow. If we keep pulling the bellows on the fork, we can burn it up to 3,000 degrees, which will melt iron. And that's not the purpose here. So we work in pumpkin colors. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna work the point first, because that's going to cool fast. There, and then we can work back and draw a taper into it before it cools. And we can do a little more here to straighten it out. Always put it back in the forge straight. Here we go. Scrunch and roll the eyelet, quench the eyelet so we can hit directly upon it and start a very tight little loop, <laughs> which we're going to close up into an omega. This is for a handle. And then we can quench this so it doesn't move. And then we can put a little back bend in it. Why have an ugly thing if you can have a pretty thing? Yeah. Right? <laughs> put a little decorative twist in the ends of this, just like so. Once, roll, twice, roll, three, and four. Now I can just take this and break it off and get it in the fire quickly. Let's finish it with a nice rounded end on it. See how that's working out? Mm. Flatten this section. There we go. Now we're going to do another scrunch and roll. Like that. We'll flip it over and get it around enough. There we go. Straighten it this way. Now, do you know what we made? It's a very important boat tool. So at the end of the day, uh -huh. when the boat's put away carefully, oh. <laughs> and your crew is happy, you can open an adult beverage that nice. comes in a... That is awesome. Yeah. So this is for you. Wow. Oh. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah, George's gonna carry that around everywhere now. We have, uh, yeah, yeah, this is gonna be a treasure, man. Thank you, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so we're here in the Cooperage, and uh, we are here with Rich, who is a man that wears many hats in the seaport. I think the first question is, what the heck is a cooperage? So cooperage is containers made of hoops and staves, and we also call our business a cooperage. Gotcha. They can have a single taper like a bucket or a pail or a tub, yeah. or they can have the complex barrel shape where you have most of the curve in the middle with diminishing amounts oh, toward the gotcha. ends. Everything from our favorite adult beverage yeah. to we have uh, medicines over here. So after we tip a barrel over and they can see how, how, uh, how they behave, Look at how much rocking it does. Yeah. So there's a lot of stored energy there that we release when we tip it over. Uh -huh. And this usually tells people how, how easy it is to move. Huh. Because we had a two-year-old come over and maneuver the barrel like this <laughs> and bring it over to mommy yeah. without being told. Huh. Really? That's Interesting. So, cool so that it's thing like could a... weigh 500 pounds. That and full you... of water would weigh about 400. <gasps> Some of these would be about 600. Whoa. It's very easy to move. It's very easy. It could spin yeah. like a figure skater. Yeah. That's good. That's a 6.0 right there. We can stand this back up um, simply by putting more energy into it. Oh, um, wow. Little by little. Interesting. Cool. So you don't have to use a lot of force. Okay, I'm gonna tip it. Go for it, buddy. There it goes. Let's go on a walk with my little barrel. Yeah. Let's play spin the bottle. Spin the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Do it. Messed up with the floor. <laughs> <laughs> she ruined everything. There it is. Nice. 
So we would start off with a square piece of wood. And the first thing we would do if we we're making a pail or a tub, we would round the outside using this draw knife. So you see how that's creating the arc of the barrel right there? And then using a hollow shave like this. See that shape? Doesn't that look like a packing peanut? Nice little round. That's what they used in the olden days. One of the benefits of being a cooper is you're making the packing material yeah. that people would specify. So that's an open blade. It's an upside down giant plane. If this is gonna be for a tub, you need to make one end of this smaller than the other. So I will start off making some small passes just at one end, maybe a long and a medium, like this, until I get that bevel and taper established. Mm. There are tools we can use like this as gauges. Mm. So do you get the impression at this point that this is labor intensive? Right. And we're not gonna be throwing these buckets away? Yeah, right. And if somebody breaks a piece, we'll fix it? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing for people to think about these days, especially. We're gonna hit twice okay. that speed okay. and then take two steps. So it'll be hit, hit, step, step. Cha cha cha. Hit, hit no cha cha. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're good. Your rhythm is good. So the Cooper's dance was used to drive the hoops symmetrically and evenly. So you can think of how many thousands of pounds of force we're putting on it holding these, these staves together. But once we've heat formed it, each one of these is a puzzle piece, so we have to number it. If we forget to number it and we take this apart, uh, we probably would ruin the product. I really never knew not only how important barrels are, but how hard they are to make, how much craftsmanship is involved. And also, I mean, that's a 4,000 year old technology is what he was saying. That was the way that human beings transported stuff for like thousands of years. So now we are gonna check out the Plymouth Cordage Company and we've got Sarah, the cord expert. <laughs> I guess that's what I am today. <laughs> yes, welcome to the Plymouth Cordage Company at Mystic Seaport. Oh, so you ready to learn how rope is made? Yeah? So this is the yarn loft up here, and what they would do is they would take the fiber, and basically run it through a big giant metal comb, like you can see over here, mm. called the hackles, to align all the fiber, and then the person would have a bundle around their waist, they'd attach it to one of the hooks here, and there'd be people spinning the spinning wheel, a skilled spinner would have it around their waist and they'd put a little bit here. They'd walk back and keep going as they went. So it would all be spinning together and, ah, all yeah. and then when they got to the end of their run, all of the material that was around their waist would be gone. Yeah, I got yarn you. spun to the right and it would have been stored on spools. Then they would go downstairs to actually take the yarns and twist them into the strands. So each and every one of the spools has a specific spot that it goes through in the rails and also a specific spot it goes to in the plates. So the yarns are twisted together to make a strand, and the strand, as you can see here, as I trip on things, goes to the left. So there's an opposite twist here. Mm. Yarns to the right, strands to the left. And this would run the entire length of the building. So this is the formula machine. This is gonna wanna make the material twist to the left. This would spin and move backwards and help pulling all of the yarns through that for me. Got to pull and twist. Yep. Yeah. Back here, we've got the three strands, three individual strands and you can see the cart, which is where the laying top would be. So it holds the strands apart until it's formed into a rope on the back side. Oh, yeah. And then this just kind of runs all the way down to the end where the afterturn machine is. So this is the afterturn machine here. All of the ends of all of the strands are attached right here in one spot. It's spinning in one direction, as I said, and then the foreturn machine is spinning in the opposite direction, helping the material to form. Well, the sun just peeked out and it's after hours at the Mystic Seaport. So we just get to like walk around and it's totally abandoned. And we get to look at these gorgeous boats that are just sun kissed right now with my big bud and my little bud down there. <laughs> and it is so awesome. I feel like just totally on top of the world right now. The longer I waited, the more that I've tried. All the years that I wasted trying to find it. All that I go through for my peace of mind, let it all go out the way. Smoke in my eyes.
One of the main attractions of the Mystic Seaport has got to be the Charles Morgan, the last wooden whale ship in the world. Built in 1841, the Morgan embarked on 37 whaling voyages, most of which lasting more than three years, and which brought her to the far reaches of the globe. At the time, whaling supplied the world with the much needed oil to fuel lanterns, as well as for lubricating the tools and machinery of the industrial age. At its peak, the American whaling fleet numbered well over 2,000 ships, most of which were designed very similarly to the Morgan. As much as whaling is abhorrent today, of course, the vessel still represents the oldest wooden merchant ship in the United States. Whaling itself provided the capital that led to a lot of the industrialization in the Northeast. But the process of whaling was, they say you could smell a whale ship before you could see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what they do is they bring the whale alongside, dismember the whale, bring pieces on board, cut them up into smaller pieces and put them in these big cast iron pots. And that's where they would render the fat of the whale into oil. I can see why that would smell pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> whale ships were particularly diverse in their crews because they bring crew on board from all over the world as well. So they'd be South Sea Islanders, Portuguese, you know, American uh, Yankees, uh, former American slaves, uh, all in this 110 feet of space. In a time when 99% of people never leave their county, let sure. alone their town. And they know what Tahiti looks like, what Hawaii looks like, what Japan looks like. That must have been quite an existence. Yeah, you know? a lot of them decided to stay too. I mean, there are uh, records of people, of ships leaving New Bedford and four years later coming back with 100% different crew. Oh, than, is that right? Than what they went out with, yeah. yeah. So this, uh, this is the galley here. This is a pretty tiny galley to feed a crew of, you said 30? Yeah. Man, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah and look at this helm. Yeah, so they it's... pull out a shin cracker, essentially. Uh, the idea is that it's a tiller that uses the mechanical advantage of the uh, oh. block and table and the drum yeah. to huh. actuate the tiller. So as you turn the wheel, it walks back and forth. Oh yeah. So they didn't really make whaling ships for tall people then? Well, you know, the thing is, creature comfort was secondary to the yeah. efficiency of the structure. So this is the captain's cabin. Pretty comfortable, actually. Yeah? Yeah. Although the toilet isn't all that nice, basically. Oh, I think it's pretty good for that time, All right, you know? get up in there and sit on yeah. it. Ah, oh, yes. This is great. <laughs> oh, it's gimbal. That is so cool. <laughs> that is cool. And then she broke the historic bed. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the officer's mess. So we've got captain, first mate, second and third mate, officer's pantry. You had people who were skilled at the harpoon activity and operating the small boat blacksmith for all of the iron work that would go on. And then commodores, uh, not only to repair the ship, but uh, Cooper to keep the barrels that were the containers for the whale oil. Yeah, like Quentin was saying, this space in particular is not designed to suit people. It's definitely designed for the purpose of the space. Yeah, so this is the folks little 22 berths in here. 22. Yeah. Notice we haven't seen any uh, showers or bathtubs on board. Yeah. yeah there must I mean, have been some greasy guys in here. <laughs> and the crew quarters are nuts to just fit as many beds as possible in this really teeny area. You can really kind of feel all of the stories and lives that pass through this boat, you know? I can just imagine being scared the first day you're aboard and you're getting ready to pick up the anchor and go to a new foreign place. You know, you're meeting everyone new around you. It's intimidating, but exciting. This room, for some reason, it just like, really makes me feel. So now we are heading into the shipyard section of the museum, and they basically built this yard so that they could restore the Charles Morgan, because these big wooden ships need to be almost completely rebuilt periodically. They are one of the premier destinations in the world for doing this kind of work. And this is Chris Sanders, who has the best beard within a 20 mile <laughs> radius. Where are we? What are we looking at? Uh, we're in the laydown yard. Uh, this is where we have short term lumber storage. So you need all this wood because, I mean, what kind of work does the shipyard normally do? The last year and a half, 15 months or so, we have replanked 
four schooners over 120 feet. For example, on pilot, I think we did 37 new planks, anywhere from about 16 feet long to 26 feet long. Uh, each one of those is three inches thick, so you're talking about a plank that weighs several hundred pounds. Sometimes we have to replace framing so that we have something to attach the planks to, that kind of thing. Taking old wood off these boats and mm -hmm. putting new wood on the boats. That is, that is the, the essence of restoration. Yeah, this was sawn uh, the day before yesterday. This oh, wow. Is, this is planking stock. You can actually feel it's the moisture in this is, is pretty evident, and you can feel it in your hand. <laughs> It's crazy because, I mean, I've been around woodworking, I've done a little woodworking, but doing woodworking with giant pieces of wood is basically completely different. You know, this place is kind of the top of the pyramid for us. Yeah. You know, the, the opportunity to work on boats like the L.A. Dunton or Mayflower 2, that never happens. This is sort of a lifelong goal for a lot of us. And since yeah. you grew up here, was that one of your kind of dreams? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I ever, I ever visited here, I was walking right through this path here. And I watched um, my future boss, actually, uh, pushing a 10-inch thick, 25-foot piece of white oak through that planer with the forklift. But I kind of, that was enough for me. Yeah. I was like, all right, I got to work here. Yeah. These guys are nuts. <laughs> so, main shop. The schooner Amistad was actually built in here mm -hmm. um, from 1998 to the year 2000. Building a boat from scratch is infinitely faster than uh, a restoring one. The joke in the industry is that restoring a boat is like building a new boat with the old one in the way. When wood boats were like an economic necessity, mm -hmm. would they restore boats or would they just burn them and then build a new? The MO back then was to build a boat, overbuild a boat initially. And uh, after 10, 15 years, you take that boat, you drive it up a creek and you build a new one. Restoration work as we know it really didn't exist until the 1970s. My favorite tool, it doesn't look like much, but this is actually a lathe. This is a spar lathe. Oh. And if you look, this bed goes all the way down to the other end of the shop. Oh, wow. So we can turn masts, uh, booms, all that kind of stuff in here up to, I think, about 95 feet long. You can do about 95% of the work here with modern power tools, but the last, like, 5% is always hand tools. You know, hmm. it's the final fitting, um, it's cutting curves, that kind of thing. So this is, this happens to be mine. This is an ads that uh, you'll never you'll never find one of these in a in a commercial yard. When you're working on the scale that we work on and you're timber framing a boat like like we do, um, there are no substitutes for a tool like this. On the one end, the seaboard is all about saying, "Hey, look at these old boats. We're going to restore them." But you're also restoring the skill of using this thing. That's such a cool secondary effect of what's going on here. You know, Quentin, my, uh, my boss actually, said the rest of the world is sort of rediscovering the skills of, of wooden boat building. He says at Mystic Seaport, they never actually left. Yeah. So the first generation of shipwrights that actually worked here, they used to work at the, uh, the yards in uh, Maine and Nova Scotia building fishing schooners in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It's sort of an unbroken chain all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. You can't say that about anywhere else on, in this country, really. You can't jump a gap when it comes to human knowledge. Right, it has exactly. to. It has to continue. You have to preserve it, exactly. Yeah. It's cool to be in the place where it's happening, too. It's like this sacred place. Yeah. It's, so neat. It does. It feels like a church. Yeah. To me, it does. Yeah. It feels like you're going to spank some of them. <laughs> Watch it, buddy. <laughs> We're like having this deep conversations, Desiree. Like, you're going to spank some of them. This is where we do all the rigging uh, at the seaport. I think the Charles Morgan alone has something like three and a half miles of rigging. Whoa. So all of that comes out of the shop. We actually invented our own type of rope that we use. It's called the uh, Mystic Three Strand, and the uh, the head rigger actually came up with it with um, New England ropes. And oh, yeah. uh, now it's sort of the sort of the industry standard for traditional looking rigging. It's a synthetic that looks like a traditional line. Yeah. So. Behind me is Shenandoah. She's got a sparred length of about 152 feet. I think her length on deck is closer to 110 feet. She was built in the 1960s at the Harvey Gamage Boatyard in Maine. She has spent her entire career out on Martha's Vineyard. And you're steaming some planks? That's right, that's our steam box. You can twist white oak like a spaghetti noodle after a couple hours in this box. Okay. 
It's interesting too because getting this piece of wood in place is basically the whole goal yes. of what's going on. But after we saw the freaking trees you have to find and then you have to cut them and you have to cut them again, I mean, it's just, it's so like deceptively simple what we're looking at, yeah. but a no. huge project. What you see here is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Man, so the shipyard was just so cool. It feels like the kind of place that you would make a pilgrimage to, you know? Just like the center of the world for this sort of thing. And I had no idea that it was gonna be like that. So it's really neat. It's a real, Jordan's like real peeing his pants right now. Yeah. Is all he means to say. Yeah. This is his dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're running because we're a little bit late, but <laughs> <laughs> basically uh, we've been invited to go out on a boat ride on this super cool boat up here, which I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, once we get on it. So let's let's jump on and head off for a little harbor cruise. We're okay. coming, Chris! <laughs> Don't pull away! Oh. Thanks for having us. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. So welcome aboard Little Vigilant. Yeah, thank you. 1950, Abbeking and Rasmussen. First yacht built in uh, the yard after World War II. Built to go through short uh, European canals. You can actually take the pilot house off at Whoa. this split. Both <laughs> masts come down. And a wheel and rudder system made for large Germans. <laughs> read that ships are the nearest thing to dreams that hands have ever made. Since the first time I stepped aboard a sailboat, I've been drawn to them. It's something about the potential of movement, of distant lands, foreign languages, of the beauty and indifference of the sea. But mostly, I think it's the freedom to dream and to follow that dream. And in the past two days, I've begun to really appreciate just how many people throughout history have experienced the pull of this same dream. Guys, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode. We wanted to give a huge thank you to the Mystic Seaport. You guys were awesome for hosting us this week, and it gave Jordan an opportunity to just nerd his little heart out. If you guys are looking for something fun and exciting to do this summer, definitely go check out the Mystic Seaport. If you're a resident of Connecticut, you actually get free admission through August. But if you're not a resident, you could also head over there right now, hop in your car, get your kids, get your dog, head to the seaport, and when you get to the ticket office, use promo code Atticus. 10 for 10% off or head on over to dockwa.com and use Atticus 10 to get 10% off of your dockage. And also mark your calendars because this August 20th through the 22nd, the Mystic Seaport is hosting the Wooden Boat Show, which is basically the mecca of all wooden boat shows. So definitely check that out. And finally, we wanted to give a shout out to some of our newest patrons. You guys are amazing and you make this channel 100% possible and we would be nothing without you. So thank you so much for all of your love, support, and encouragement. And bear with us because we're still working out the kinks of our bosun and first mate level shout outs. So eventually I'm going to get some dry erase boards here and here. But in the meantime, I wanted to thank our newest bosun level patron, Bob Oates. And to our newest yacht master level patrons, thank you so much. James Kiever, Floyd Graves, Steve Hamill, Robert Clark, Barry Nelson, Len Rhodes, Paul Schmidt, Kevin Giffen, Jeff and Shannon DeVette, Scott and Diane Schmidt, Cameron Clopton, miss you dude. And moving on to our deckhand level patrons, thank you so much. Mike Caudill, Vikings Double Wide, Roger Peterson, Lewis Brooks, Kirk Bauer, David Olson, Ronald D. Ray, Mark and Lori Peterson, Belia Welter, Travis and Corinne Mayo, Captain Ray Markham, Dan and Mariula, Carlos Berlanga, Jim Bradley, Dan Vermerskirken, and Tim Winslow. How yes. now, brown cow? <laughs> <laughs> nice, buddy, nice. So thanks again. You guys are amazing, and we'll catch you next week.